Good morning to Antelope Road Christian Fellowship, twice removed. Due to flooding in our sanctuary, uh, the last couple weeks we've been meeting at Leatherby's, and this is the first week of a two-week session here at Rush Park Auditorium. Welcome. I'm sure that Pastor Greg, uh, one of the reasons why he wanted me to teach today is because he knew that I'd be finished before 3.30 when the Super Bowl began. I do have a vested interest, <laughs> as some of you also might have. So welcome. Uh, today we are uh, working through a series that said, Will the real Jesus please stand up? And this is the fourth section. And uh, we're going through the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John. One of the things that we're really pleased about when we teach the Gospel of John is that John, at the end of the book, actually speaks to us um, to what the actual purpose of the Gospel is. Like, what? why did he write the Gospel? And we actually find it in John chapter 20, verse 31, where he says, But these things are, are written to you, that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the, is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So, if we're not presenting the gospel that, that clearly states that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and our purpose is by believing in this, you would have eternal life, then we're missing the point. And any Christian church that doesn't come to that conclusion is missing the point. So today, we're just pleased to, to speak to the gospel that says, this is why we're doing it. We want to be very clear, as John is clear. And so, and, and that's John 5, or John uh, 20, verse 31. Uh, today, we're going to be reading... Uh, and and I, I have notes there, and in the sermon notes, I actually uh, filled in the blanks there because I didn't want you to miss it. <laughs> I underlined it and I filled it in because I don't want you to put any other message into this, right? Um, and and the, uh, the, the next thing, in my assignment, um, I get to read, uh, and, and our study will be on John chapter 5, verse 31 through 36, but it's in the midst of a discourse. And so we really want to um, look at the context so that we can understand it. And, and I'd like to start reading in John chapter uh, 5, verse 18. Uh, and it says, So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him, for he had not only broke the Sabbath, he called his he, he called God his father, thereby making him equal with God. So if you have notes, please fill in the word equal, right? And and the the issue is when Jesus spoke that he was equal with God, the Jewish leaders, the rabbis, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the, the Sanhedrin, they were, uh, they were upset, they were incensed, because Jesus didn't fit what they expected Jesus to be. When anyone said that they were equal to God, by their definition, they either um, had to be, uh, it, it could be the truth, which they didn't believe, otherwise they would call that blasphemy, and Jesus deserved to die. So what we're really going to be finding out here is that there is a trial that is going on, going to occur here in the dialogue. The, the Jewish leaders are trying to kill him because they believe that he's guilty uh, of death. And we're going to see Jesus' response. In fact, um, let's, let's see what the next thing it says. Yeah, it says they, they tried all the, 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 uh, all the more to... Uh, kill him, right? Uh, and, and we're going to find that Jesus starts by saying, let me explain to you. So he's giving a defense. And, and let me just 
you know, in in the fact that Jesus explained, he this is a uh, first of all, it's a it's a different sort of conversation. This section from verse eighteen through the end of the chapter is so different than most of the biblical gospel teaching. Most of the time, Jesus is speaking to the, the, the general public, and he's speaking about agriculture and farming and shepherding, uh, house building, just, just fishing. He's dealing with you know, common, everyday occurrences, and, and so he's trying to meet and deal with things that the common folks would understand. In this context, we're seeing something totally different. We're, what we're seeing here is that Jesus is speaking to Jewish leaders, the rabbis, so he's actually using a rabbinical approach. He's talking about theology. He's saying, let me tell you the deeper meaning and the depth of who God is. He's actually designing a teaching for the teachers. So that's what he's doing here. And, and he goes in to explain a, a, a few certain things that um, don't make the teachers very easy <laughs> intellectually. And, and I'm, I'm just going to go through them. It's already been uh, expressed in the, the last three sermons, so I, I don't want to overdo it. But I, I just want to tell you some of the things that Jesus says from verse 18 uh, through 31. He says that the son does what the father does. Um, that doesn't sound too bad, does it? Except the Jews knew that the Father was the Savior, the life giver. They, they, they weren't really happy with the fact that the Son, that, and Jesus is speaking of himself, that the Son was equal in that manner. The next thing Jesus says, just as the Father gives life, to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. Well, wait a minute. Jesus is saying that he also is a life giver, that he also has the power to raise from the dead. The Jews aren't really comfortable with that at all. In fact, you can see why they would be upset. The next thing he says, all judgment given to the Son, it is given to the Son, so that the Son is honored as the Father is honored. Well, wait a minute. First of all, we have to understand that how the Jews honored the Father is that they didn't even speak His name out loud. They were they honored Yahweh so much that they don't they didn't even spell out the name. They just used code letters, right? You know, it's like FBI. We don't want to say Federal Bureau of Investigation. No, we, we, they just use codes. They, they honored the Father's name so much that they didn't even want to speak the name. And now Jesus is saying that he needs to be and should be honored in the same level. Man, they are really having a problem with that. The next thing he says, whoever hears my word and believes me, believes him, excuse me, who sent me, shall have eternal life. All of a sudden, Jesus is critical in the belief of Jesus and in Jesus, and what he did is critical to eternal life. Man, they're losing their gourd right there, right? But these are the things Jesus is speaking to the rabbis, to the teachers. And another thing, the Father has life in himself, and he has granted the same life-giving power to the Son. Again, setting himself equal to the Father. And the last, the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So we see that Jesus is, is just being very clear to these Jewish leaders, to the teachers, that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, which is the same word. Messiah is the Old Testament word, Christ is the New Testament word for Messiah. And so he is the Christ, and he says, believing in me will give you eternal life. The Jewish leaders could not be any more convinced that Jesus needed to die at that point. And so Jesus, we see in starting in verse 31, where Jesus starts his defense. So we have a testimony for the accused. Notice what he says, and I'm going to read the, the, um, 
the first, in fact, I'll read the, the uh, whole scripture. And it says, If I were to, t to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. But, but someone else is also testifying about me. And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist, and his testimony about me was true. Of course, I have no need of human witnesses, but I say these things so that you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message. But I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. And the Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. And so what we see here is that Jesus starts speaking to these Jewish leaders about testimony. He starts giving um, testimonies. And, and from our point of view, it's like you know, from the, the Greek mindset, which we all have, or most of us have, <laughs> um, we're looking at like, what is Jesus doing? And, and so we sort of need to kind of, um, you know, rethink or, or kind of get a, a different perspective. So let, let me kind of work it this way. Um, from the Jewish perspective, their training was that if anyone was guilty or brought before a judge, uh, there was a need for uh, two. Well, let me let me back up a little bit. Let's let's go to first uh, verse thirty one. Uh, Jesus starts uh, by saying, "Let me get to it. Let me get it. If I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid." So you can write in the word "valid." Personal testimony is not valid, right? And so basically, if I say something about me that I'm a good person, um, that really doesn't mean anything. And in fact, you just the, the news of the day uh, of the news of the week was um, solely or not solely, but mainly about the, the passing and the tragic death of Kobe Bryant and his daughter and and the seven other people uh, with them on the helicopter recently. And. We've seen an outpouring of celebrities and friends and uh, people of of note saying how um, good of a person Kobe Bryant is and how it, you know at 41 it's he was too young and and I, I want to tell you in in the human sense um, we feel like we can judge good or bad young or old fair or unfair. But that doesn't equate with what God thinks is important in the sense that um, Kobe being a good man uh, may be a public opinion. Not, and I know not all, all people agree with that. But him being a good man does not equate with God's favor and God's approval necessarily. He may be a good man by worldly standards, and, and people, you know, what we see is people have come out and said, this is what I think about Kobe. And what I want to look at, it's like, what does God think about us, right? That's the important part. And, and Jesus really says, hey, listen, if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. And, well, Jesus wouldn't be lying, but it, testifying about yourself or having a, a, a good opinion of yourself by itself is not enough. And, and so let's sort of take a look. Um, there is a principle inside of the depth of Judaism that's transferred over uh, to Christianity. And it's the principle of two or three witnesses. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 19, we see it says that a single witness shall not suffice against a person for a crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. 
only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. The, the requirement of two or three witnesses. In Hebrews 10, 28, it repeats that. So we have an Old Testament reference, New Testament. It says, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So Jesus knows that. And so he's speaking to Jewish leaders and teachers who definitely live by that code inside of the Old Testament. Right? So that that's a that's a big deal, okay? Um, and so so Jesus is going to mount a defense with three witnesses, right? And so let's take a look at at uh, Jesus's uh, response again in verse 30, uh, 32. But someone else has, is also testifying about me. Then I assure you that everything he says about me is true. Now he's talking about his father. He's talking about the God the Father. The Father has testified about him. And he's not going to mention him right now. But but the Father's word for him is true. And, in fact, and, and then he goes to in verse 33. He said, in fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist and his testimony about me was true. Uh, of course, I have no need for human witnesses. I'll pause right there. So let's take a look at what that testimony of John the Baptist is all about. Well, let's let's kind of finish this one. He says, of course, I have no need of human witnesses, but I say these things so you might be saved. So uh, you can fill that in in the fill-in sheet that you might be saved is sort of important, right? We're going to go back to that a little bit. But if you go to John chapter 1, earlier in the book, verse 19 through 34, the, the uh, scripture says this, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said to them, I am not the Messiah. Well, then who are you? They asked, are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then, then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way of the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees, who had been sent, asked him, If you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Through his ministry, excuse me, though his ministry follow mine, I am not even worthy to be his slave and, un and untie the straps of his sandals. This encounter took place in Bethany, an, east, an area east of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I, I am. For he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest in is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. What? John the Baptist gave a sterling testimony of who Jesus was. He even said, at first I didn't see it, and then I saw it, <laughs> right? He, he, he actually says, listen, I, I saw something that I wasn't expecting, right? So why is it important that Jesus say that John the Baptist was someone who could testify and did testify on my account? Well, here's the deal. 
the Jewish leaders knew who John the Baptist was. First of all, he was the son of Zacharias, uh, a, a temple uh, high priest. Uh, they knew the story of John the Baptist's birth. It was probably something that was a bit legendary. They knew that the birth of John the Baptist uh, also... Uh, that, that John the Baptist was a Nazarite, which means he was set apart. He didn't drink wine, didn't eat grapes. Uh, he kept away from dead things. He, he was a Nazarite. He was set apart and holy. And then, then as he matured, and he's slightly older than Jesus, so he's in, he's in his early 30s um, or 30-ish, um, all of a sudden he begins a ministry uh, telling the people of Israel that the Messiah is on his way to get your house in order, to get your life in order, to come and be baptized and repent from your sins. And the, the, the Jewish leaders, the people of Israel, you know, they, they rushed to John. They, they wanted the Messiah so badly and they knew that they needed to, to get right before him that they fully believed in John the Baptist, they saw him as a prophet. They saw him as a voice from heaven, a voice from God to them. So one of the reasons why Jesus uses John was because the Jews, the Jewish leaders, saw him as an authority from God. So he was a valid, legitimate um, witness of who Jesus was, right? And so... <laughs> You know, one of the things in verse 34, he says that I don't need John the Baptist, right? Of course, I have no need of human witnesses, not me, but I say these things so you might be saved. Now, <laughs> some of you might have this little um, reaction to the fact of human witnesses are used and affect our salvation. Now, I'm not disagreeing with or saying a scriptural premise because we know that it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. But then what is Jesus saying? Why are human witnesses important so that I might be saved? And I, I believe part of the thing that Jesus speaks of, and, and we'll see in the next thing he says John was like this is verse 35 John was like a burning and shining lamp and you were excited for his message you were excited for a while about his message and and I want to tell you that I believe that there are people in your life that are a lamp not the source of light but the lamp by which you get excited about the things of God. I, I, and that's where the fill-in right there, who has or is God using or used in your life as a lamp to draw you to Jesus. And I believe that everyone who has a, or most everyone, I can't say everyone, most everyone who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is drawn because of another human being, whether that's your parents or siblings or children or grandchildren. Uh, it, it might be a friend, a co-worker, a, a co-student. Uh, for me, I remember the people, and it was more than one, the people in my life that, that uh, just either represented a, a relationship with Jesus or specifically open the word of God to me. And without them physically being there, I, I might not have known. And I, 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 more than that, I believe that, that the human connection is what God and how God chooses to spread his gospel. So I believe that each one of us could probably say there are people that we have been warmed by that they have become their lamps to us, right? Even in, in this church here, there are people that either have brought you the truth of the word or continually 
continue to bring the word of, of the gospel to you. Even now, this message may be something that warms you, that, that encourages you and draws you into a deeper walk with God. That is the purpose of the body of Christ, right? And, and the other part to that is that um, who are you testifying to about what Jesus has done in your life? So I have received plenty from people about who Jesus is in their life. They've told me what Jesus has done. But you too are designed to be someone who says, wait a minute, can I tell you what Jesus did in my life? So <laughs> part of the thing that we realize is that we are continually on this process where things happen to us and we're to share those to encourage other people so that they can personally experience and share their experiences with others. The life and the process of the Church of God is always moving, right? There are things in my life, for example, um, that, that I cannot deny, right? I, I, just, I just cannot deny. And so I share those as a testimony. And so John the Baptist was a prophet sent by God and and I don't want to be blasphemous here but some of you may act may be acting or called to ask act as a prophet as a as a spokesman as a messenger uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ and in fact I think I believe when it says go make disciples I think uh, to all the world, I think that that's ultimately what the call of Christ is, is that we are to spread the message that we've received of the redemption um, by the blood of the Lamb and, and our experiences with Jesus. So I think that that's a very, very cool process. Um, the, the next thing that Jesus says, and this is in uh, verse 36, he says, but I have a greater witness than John. Oh, that's cool. And that's my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. So, part of the thing when we look at it is, what was Jesus teaching, and what, what about these miracles? Now, Jesus is saying the teachings, the, the, the things that I say, the things that I have to tell you, um, and the miracles you see, you know, they, they, they give evidence to the fact that the Father's in me, or the Father sent me. And we actually see that if you go to the Gospel of John, verse, or chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. So in John chapter 3, we actually see the introduction of a man named Nicodemus. And we'll, we'll, it actually describes him fairly decently. So if you've got your scripture there, it says, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak to Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident, or evidence that God is with you. See, the Jews, the Jewish leaders, knew that Jesus was from God, not just because John said, but but because Jesus was a a a evidence because he produced teachings that blew them away that referenced the love of the father but also by the things he did by the miracles he performed by raising or, or by you know healing the the lame or um, recovering sight to the blind or bringing hearing or curing leprosy or raising from the dead there were things that Jesus did that had to come from God right and and I think that Part of the thing that I, I want to encourage us is that, um, you know, what, and this is in your notes, what revelations or miracles have you experienced that have come from the Father? What 
what statements, what scriptural, it could be a scriptural verse, it could be from a mess, from a, a, a sermon or a message or a podcast. What word has come to you that has changed your thinking? And I, I, I have testimony in my life where, where I've read the Bible or the, you know, and the, the scripture itself has changed my thinking. I cannot undo that. Right, and and I've also experienced miracles where I know that there, and, and that's the second part. You know that there are there are things in my life, miracles where um, I can't I can't explain it except God did it. I say it this way that there are plenty of times in my life where I should not be living. <laughs> I I've done the wrong move. I've I've I've. Uh, I've just misstepped or uh, been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I shouldn't be alive. Um, there, there was one time I've shared with some that that I was on a road uh, uh, going up to Oregon, and uh, it was icy. We were going on a ski trip, and I have my wife and all my children and my mother-in-law in our Aerostar, and we... We start spinning. It was my fault that we started spinning, but we started spinning. Up this up the road is a eighteen wheeler coming in the opposite direction and and we start spinning and while we're spinning we're singing before we start spinning we are singing The Lord told Noah to build him an Arky Arky, an old children's song. We're just singing in the car and all of a sudden my car starts spinning slowly seemingly forever and i just remember the lord speaking to me very directly do not touch the wheel and i can tell you i didn't touch the wheel i knew that if i touched the wheel i was i was done with <laughs> i was done for and me and my family and it came to the point where we were almost fully straight not quite and the Lord said, push the brakes. And I pushed the brakes and we, we slid safely into a, a snow pile to the right of the road. See, I can't unknow that. <laughs> I, I can't change the narrative. Um, I, I was the problem. I shifted gears in the midst. Silliness because of my, my lack of understanding of everything. But, but God was showing me something that a lot of times in my life, I don't understand why things happen. And I I find myself fully relying on God's power and strength. And so I, I look at that, right? Um, I, I have to yield to the fact of that. But but we see also that, see, we, we see another thing in the Gospel of Luke 7, 18 through 22. We see Jesus... Um, sort of reassuring John the Baptist even. Uh, and, and so, and starting in verse 18, Luke 7, 18 through 22 says this. The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything Jesus was doing. So John called two of his, his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask him, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? Right, John the Baptist was just like everyone else. He he had a witness. He saw it, but but then he didn't know because he didn't know what to expect either. Verse twenty says, John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, "John the Baptist sent us. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else?" At that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits. And he restored sight to many who were blind. Then he told John's disciple, disciples, go back to John and tell him that you have seen and heard the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. Right? So what's very cool about this message is that, you know, a lot of us may have questions about who Jesus is. And Jesus says, first of all, I have a testimony of John the Baptist. 
a prophet, as some someone someone significant to you is going to tell you who Jesus is. But additionally, there are things in your life you cannot explain without knowing that God is the source. See, those are two that were significant back in the time of of Jesus, but is also significant to us, right? And, and Jesus even says this, that the Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. Now, at this point, this actual time when Jesus said that, we know that the greatest work for him that he was to accomplish was still ahead of him, was probably less than a year away where he was, was going to be the sacrificial lamb um, sacrifice for our benefit, that the blood of the lamb would be shed for our sins, that there would be a death, a burial, and resurrection. The, the, the fullness of the, the work that, that God sent Jesus to accomplish was, was not quite full and not quite finished, right? That was yet to come. But Jesus did those things for us.